Hello and welcome to today's Lemongrass Live. My name is Joe Derry Bennett from the Lemongrass Marketing Team. I'd also like to welcome our discussion leaders from Lemongrass today. We have Jason Nicholl, Mike Walker, Barry Cullen and Hello. Mike Larnan. Welcome to you all. Uh, just before we start, for those of you that haven't joined a Lemongrass Live before, we encourage as much engagement as possible. So um, you'll see on your screen there's a, a chat panel, a questions section. Feel free to type in any questions at any time. We'll try and answer as many as we can in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, those that we can't answer, we'll follow up directly with you afterwards. So with the admin out of the way, let's just get started with the topic. So we hear a lot about near zero downtime. There are approaches, tools, techniques, methods, you know, it, it's in there. Some people say it's not important or only for big databases. The other question is, if it's just a one off so consideration, so it's only a minor part of an evaluation going to cloud. Today, we have a Mythbusters panel of experienced team members to dispel some of those myths around NZDT. So with that, I'll hand over to Jason. Thanks ever so much. Thanks, Joe. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone for joining today. Uh, probably our last one for the year from, from an APAC perspective. As Joe said, we record these sessions. So certainly if there's others that you want to go and see, have a look at that. I'm pretty excited to host today's session. Um, as a technical specialist, Lemongrass um, works with companies that are looking to run SAP in the cloud. Um, we evaluate concepts, including near zero downtime all the time, including how customers understand the difference. To be honest, myself, I started in a from a non-technical background. So when I started dealing with these concepts, uh, when I joined five years ago, I thought it was just for massive databases and now I know so fundamentally different. Um, so today we're going to explain basically what it is, certainly what we're seeing in the market, um, how it applies to all aspects of what we do for our customers, big, small, large databases and not, and how some of the emerging um, concepts such as mutable infrastructure apply. Um, but having just admitted that I'm not the most technical in the room, um, I certainly wanted to introduce our Mythbusters panel. So um, Joe's already mentioned the names, but Mike's our lead architect from an Asia Pacific perspective and part of the team. Mark heads our delivery and um, Barry looks after our managed services and I'm Jason Nikolai, look after the region from a lemongrass perspective. But we've got a, a pretty informal session today. We're gonna talk uh, around a few myths around when it comes to near zero downtime, but. Uh, I think before we jump into the myths, let's obviously start with the obvious. Uh, what is the concept of near zero downtime? So, Mike, do you want to give us your view on what it is? Uh, yes, thanks, Jace. Uh, thanks for the introduction as well. Um, near zero downtime. I think if you just say that word again in your own head, you probably everybody has their own opinion what it is. Uh, it originated, of course, for migrations. Uh, because it's very important for businesses to just reduce the uh, allowable downtime, the business downtime, to make those changes. So, yeah, that's just my view on this. Uh, anyone else? Well, from my perspective, that that being said, the concept of NZDT it, it isn't new, and and it is proven in the market um, across many vendors and uh, many successful migrations now. Um, it's now the application of um, near zero downtime to a wide range of scenarios is, is what's really changing. So applying automation, for example, changes what is possible. And it is essential uh, to consider those approaches, not only for, for a migration, but importantly, um, and probably more importantly now, in the operation of, of your SAP in the cloud. Yep, yeah, agree. It's usually uh, the one-off, right? Migration is one-off. It's, it's nice if you can compress that time frame, but it, it's more the, the ongoing uh, maintenance. Agreed. So, so there needs to be a, obviously an efficient migration, but certainly for the long term, there needs to be a, a, a needs to be a view of where you can make those savings using NZDT on a on a monthly <laughs> basis on a, on a frequent basis. It's one of those acronyms we've got to get better, don't we? NZDT. We all get tied <laughs> up on it. <laughs> Well, right, let's let's break let's break some myths then. So, as I said at the start, not being the most technical in the room, myth number one: mm. near zero downtime is it only for large databases? Mike, uh, you touched on it. Give us your view. 
Yeah, look, it's, it's definitely beneficial for those large databases for obvious reasons, right? Especially if, if you look at cloud migrations from one location to another location, you, you have to move that data. And the more data you have to move, the longer it takes. Depends on several factors uh, as well. But even smaller databases, it, depends, it really depends on your business requirements and what type of business. Uh, nowadays, it's an always on environment. A lot of companies, they run international. So the, there's not much time for long outages. So yes and no. Uh, it, large databases, yes, uh, definitely essential. But for smaller databases or for other just applications, definitely valuable uh, because it just reduces your business uh, downtime and yeah every dollar not in the air is a dollar lost yeah for sure mike it's a good point and you know the nzdt concepts and and the uh, uh, automation that that is coupled to it it does become a lot more powerful in those scenarios for example when we look at our our heck migration patterns and the approach that we yeah. use so within heck as we all know, it's very carefully controlled um, and access is restricted both contractually and operationally. So it's, it's difficult to, to, to get in there and make changes. And that can be very different from on-prem or, or, or private cloud uh, landscapes and, and the like. So with Lemongrass and the Lemongrass HEC pattern, mm. we enable over the wire migrations, which eliminates huge amounts of time and it eliminates risk also for the transition of the backups for loss of data as you're using uh, HANA system replication to replicate that data across. This has an enormous impact. It reduces the outage uh, window and the duration. Uh, it, it certainly eliminates or reduces the risk for data loss. And most importantly, it allows the business to resume normal operations much quicker uh, and automation is key in supporting this approach. Yeah. So it sounds like, and thank you for that, guys. It sounds like from from two perspectives, one, it's not just big databases. Um, yes, it's really important for big databases, and we've done that for for customers across the region for sure. Big is is important. Um, that definitely drives an NZDT approach, but also small outage windows. So if you've got a twenty four by seven operation. And it's important or are you requiring something like a unique heck pattern over the wire again it, it's a concept of nzdt so look i think that one's busted right so it's not just for large databases it's it's a it's a combination of size of database outage of the window and really the type of migration source target you're doing so we'll call that one busted all right let's get on to the second one um so near zero downtime, we, we talked all of those of scenarios were really around migration. And that's where you do hear a lot about this concept. But does NZDT just apply to migrations? Barry, what's your view? Oh, not the case, I would say, Jason. Um, so I guess you know, what, we've, what we're seeing with customers, you mentioned 24 by 7 from a migration perspective. You know, the, the similar concept is there for customers. They are looking to interact with their customers 24 by 7 um, and we know that you know obviously the hyperscalers reliability has increased um, so that desire for downtime um, really has shrunk from what yeah. we see um, you know you've got your um, standard patching and upgrades um, you know they've always been considered uh, an option for downtime but you know as we uh, as technology moves on um, and as the the business and the customer and the look to to provide a better service to the customer base um you know those opportunities those windows are shrinking alongside of that um so you know some of the things that we look at from a, an operations perspective is is probably you know we've spoke before about uh, digitizing a service catalog um yeah. you know, making that more consumable self-service type approach um to services uh you know we've discussed automate um we've got some customers there seek for example that are doing um, os patching automatically we've got linfox they've got the ability to to create sap uh, extended warehouse management systems on aws automatically you know and and, and all of that ensures that you know the downtime uh, requirements are minimized so it's uh, yeah, no it's definitely not 
um, just for migrations. Mike, you any? Any, any yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, and you already touched based on on that uh, OS patching, right? That, that every now and it's all happening in the news. Every country probably, but especially in Australia, ransomware and, and cyber attacks. So we we have automated uh, automation patterns to do forward patching, and also we have a, a ransomware pattern as well to protect the data. But that's only possible. When you have an automation platform like Lemongrass, Lemongrass Cloud Platform uh, as an enabler to do that sort of automation, yeah, and yeah, and in the past on-prem you can have you can build HA environments and clusters, but those are very costly, yeah, purchase-wise, maintenance-wise, etc. When you migrate onto the cloud and and with the use of automation, it's much more accessible to have those patterns in place and. When you need to perform an upgrade or, or patching, you just build it, patch it, destroy it. So it's, it's much more flexible in the cloud. Yep. Okay, thanks, guys. I think uh, I think it's fair to say that we've uh, we've obviously proven that that is uh, not the case. It's not just for migrations. Certainly, what we're seeing from a managed service perspective is service levels, as Barry pointed out, are getting. Uh, more demanding. So back in the day, it was acceptable to have production at 95%, and then it was 99.7, and now we're in in high nine. So that's certainly driving these patterns. But then also, as Mike mentioned, the emerging security threats are looking at fail forward patterns where you're patching nodes and and never actually yeah. taking the system down um, as a way of flushing out things like ransomware. So um, this concept of immutable SAP scenarios is being touted around by many of the, the large large researchers and, and market-driven organizations, but it is actually becoming a reality and we're seeing it across our customers now. So taking risk and cost out of those scenarios um, with a real focus on maximum uptime in operations. Right, let's, uh, let's take that a little bit, bit further as far as I guess a different different dimension. So myth number three, that uh, NZDT is really just software you buy. So we've talked about automation, but it, is it just software? Mark, what's your view from a delivery perspective? Put the software in buy and it's fine? Yeah, just, just put in the software. Look, um, look obviously it's very important, but um, uh, let's not underestimate uh, the value of experience and knowledge and uh, here at lemongrass we we, uh, we really do have some uh, some very dedicated and and, and experienced people uh, that use this software to to deliver these very successful outcomes look if we look at super retail group for example we used a, a specialist and dedicated nzdt migration team who are responsible for you know very detailed analysis of the data and volumes um that 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 are required for that optimal mi migration approach so so you know there's huge amounts of experience within that team alone couple that with the project management team and the governance and the architects to plan the all important outage windows coupled um to the nzdt migration um and what we do is we supplement that we trial it with that nzdt team and we refine it and we go again to prove out what is acceptable to the customer's eyes for that outage window. So there's a lot more work than just the software in there. We also um, should consider the, uh, uh, the organizational and project cost impact versus the reward in trying to get smaller and smaller windows uh, for, these, for these outages. You know, the, the smaller the target downtime, the more cycles of planning, the more rehearsals you need, the more fine tuning you need, and and really that attention to detail can incur an, an additional cost. So you know, if, if if we talk about the run sheets that that we all know that we use for every single migration, we have to workshop and detail every single step in there down to the the time duration, the responsibility. So it's important to have that, but not to the point where it becomes cost prohibitive. Um, yep. because we have to follow those exactly to meet that target downtime window. So Makes experience sense. counts for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Experience that counts. The software is just 
just a tool or a, to, to use, right? But uh, if you if you use the wrong skill set to use the tool, you you still have a, a large time time window. But then uh, back to that SOG project, uh, Mark. So that was like a forty, almost a forty terabyte database, right? And it was running on a bit of a another modern uh, operating system and they had an outdated SAP version as well and then still they had a desire to modernize and, and move their system onto the cloud on AWS in this case. So when you probably do the traditional approach uh, they would have a bis business outage of maybe four or five days. So how fast did the delivery team uh, deliver this? Uh, we did it in, um, I think it was sub 13 hours, could have been less in the end. I think it was between 11 and 13 hours in the end. So, so it's a significant yeah. risk, uh, sorry, a significant difference that, that reduced that, that risk to the business. Obviously, they're a retail organization and uh, having a five day outage is, is just unacceptable. Yeah, no, sir, we no. did We did two or three trials there, didn't we, Mark, to, to yes. perfect that 13, yeah. We, we, we did, I think, we did three in the end to perfect that for sure, yeah. I think, uh, yeah. I mean, from an operate perspective, um, you know, in terms of is it just software, uh, it's definitely not, you know, I mean, we, we've, we've talked numerous occasions now about um, digitizing service delivery catalogs, um, you know, we've also talked about the importance of automation, um, but, you know, you, you, you've got to look at, you know, the hyperscalers are changing at a, a ridiculous rate at this point in time, um, yep. you know, and, and you need, you know, we, we've touched upon it earlier, but you need some expertise there um, to guide you through and, and to, to help you understand, you know, what, what applies to you, what doesn't, uh, but again, how we can improve those, uh, you know, unchangeable statuses that you currently have, a customer may have in terms of downtime availability to us. Um, so it's definitely not um you know just purchase uh, product and put it in from, from an operate perspective anyway no and then again so with the software we have we have, we have seen this example srg they were moving from uh, a non-cloud supported operating system to a cloud supported version but we have also worked with other customers even here in melbourne and it was basically a one-on-one -on -one kind of lift and shift uh mechanism and then we use cloud native tools to do block level replication and that, that also replicate the downtime a lot yeah so hyperscalers are picking up which is good so we're not reliable on on the on sap software to perform those near zero downtime migrations so we can also use other tools but again you need the skills <laughs> to, to work with those tools and, and have the best outcome for, for the business yeah agreed yeah okay well, thank you, team. We'll call number three busted then. It's a lot more than just software. By the sounds of it, it's, it's uh, planning and uh, leveraging lots of experience as well. Um, so let's uh, move on to number four. Um, obviously, we've talked about migrations. We've talked about operate. Um, but do you need a massive pipe to connect to your systems in order to allow this data to flow through? Is it, is it just that you can only do it with a big direct connect or does it still apply to VPN and other scenarios? What's your view, Mike? Yeah, look, uh, the, a big a big pipe is is welcome for especially for those large database migration and and, and if you do a system conf conversion as well. But you now we've migrated uh, customers over a VPN connection, especially when you replicate the data from source to target. So we well, with our LCP migrate, we we look at your database table structures and data what is hardly updated or changed, we can migrate in a weeks before the go live, easy over a smaller pipeline. Uh, system will catch up and then the cut over will be just the last transactions and, and then you're live, so it's, it's that simple. Uh, and, and, and with the cloud native tools as well, right? If you use block level replication, just yeah. implement it, install it, it will run, it will replicate itself. So you don't have, you don't need a massive pipeline, right? But for system conversions, I would still recommend you, you need at least a one gigabyte per second uh, speed, 10 is even better. Yeah, because okay. you talk for, for roughly 1.5 terabytes average the ERP database size, one gig speed is uh, three, four hours, 10 gig speed, yeah. it's 20 minutes. Yeah, good point. 
Yeah, look, look, agreed. But but again, just coming back to what I was saying earlier, it it does come back to solid planning in the first place, relying on the experience and and the approach that that experience brings, building in the trials to to, to prove it out as well. So you know, always consider a, a a POC to test the unknowns before moving into the core migration. Look, from our experience, and certainly over the ones that I've done in the past sort of fifteen months, quite often. Um, it can be the network and not the connection that needs adjustment to suit the actual migration itself. And ultimately, the experience of the team um, um, comes to bear once again, working in close collaboration with our customers uh, to navigate through uh, any arising issues. The hyperscale always, or hyperscalers always help out as well, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really good team effort. But in a few of the migrations where we haven't used large pipes and uh, high connection speeds. We have unearthed network issues for site-to-site -site VPN related to firewall configuration and quality of service that actually has impeded, uh, impeded performance. Um, and it has been the, the experience of our team um, working with the customer to actually enable the customer to fix those network issues on their side and, and proceed uh, then at pace with the migration. So. Uh, great to have a big pipe, but but obviously the experience comes to bear again. Mm. Yeah, probably not the case really from an operate perspective. You know, like uh, that's not necessarily the focus for us. Um, you know, we're we're already on the hyperscaler, so we're not necessarily concerned too much about that. Uh, I would always uh, hark on about uh, automation and process. That would be what we would be able to okay. focus on on more so. Mm. Thank you. Sounds like uh, myth number four is uh, is busted. Um, okay. We definitely don't need a large pipe. It helps, obviously, as you say. But um, I, I like that idea that you had, Mark, around doing a POC or doing some sort of assessment really early on, trialing a workload. I know we've done a bunch of those. It's a very common thing for us to engage from an assessment perspective early on to test out anything that customers are nervous about. But it also I think to your point, Mark, that you made really well was it flushes out a lot of the network stuff early yeah. up so that yeah. any lead time in changes a network or changes a connection can be done because if you're dealing with a, a local telco provider that provides that service for you, quite often there's a lead time that you don't want to then transfer into your project. A good point. Maybe maybe I could jump in with a related question if that's all right. Um, sure. And I don't think this has been covered yet, but um, well, the question is, what is the best time for a customer to have downtime? I'm guessing they were, they're talking about migrate, as, as you were saying, Barry, it's not quite the same in um, the operate phase. So how do you determine that? And, and is that something that, that you kind of look at in the POC? Don't know who wants to take that one. Oh, look, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I don't, I don't think there's one size fits all. I think coming from a technology perspective, um, it, it tends to be a Friday night or a Saturday night when the business users aren't around, but actually it's probably more granular than that these days. So it depends on industry. It also depends on the application. If it's an application that's not being heavily used, we can be moving them during the week, for example. There's no real restriction on that or even using during the day, depending on the on the source and target. But um, I think it's going to come down to the the ultimate outage windows. So if we, we used Super Retail Group as the example before, but that outage of the 13 hours was immediately after their stores closed on a Saturday and had to be finished by the time their stores opened on a Sunday. Um, so for them, it, it was really an operational um, view of, of when the best downtime was, but that, that's all part of the planning that Mark talked about. Yeah, and some other businesses, it's, it's not about retail, but they have restrictions about uh, bushfire season, right? So they, we, we can't move yeah, any point. systems during bushfire seasons. Or we've, uh, there are many more examples. It really depends on, on the business, and, and we will work with any business and, and, and make it work for them. But yeah, I think there are good points from you, Jason, as well. To just why can't you move system during the week? Uh, We've got a 25, uh, 200 by 7 company, so we can work around the globe as well. So we, we, we just continue. And we quite often do, certainly in non-productive environments, we, we, we have customers that are more than happy that they can be moved outside of a weekend. Yeah, maybe this is a related question then. So um, I think 
the answer has already been given, but it, the question is, why can't it be zero? Why is it near zero? Maybe, maybe elaborate on that, because you just mentioned there are different types of migration or different times that you, you can migrate, but why is it not zero? Yeah, yeah zero, it's just, my... uh, uh, from a technical point of view, it's just impossible. You, you can't have zero. There's always something, even a small restart of an instance of a, ne a network switch. There's always some point that there is uh, a downtime necessary. So it, that is still a myth, that, that the, the zero downtime approach. It's always near zero, but we tried as close uh, and minimized as possible to accommodate the business requirements. There's always yeah, the businesses, uh, there's always a gap, right? So and we, 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 and we work in that gap and make it as small as possible. Yeah, and I look, yeah. if I take it from an operate perspective, Joe, um, with like some of our fail forward patterns, even if in a clustered environment, you're patching a node, um, mm. getting it up and then it's literally putting it back in. So it's a DNS switch, it's still, it's still a the spinny wheel is still on the screen, even if it's sub second. So it's never exactly zero, exactly. but it yeah. but it can be very fast. Yeah. And I guess Everybody you touched, oh, sorry. Yeah. I guess you touched so, on the point earlier though, it's that balancing act between what the business requires, the cost, all of the preparation. There is a tipping point, I guess, against how long that downtime can be or should be. So um yeah, very, very yeah. um complex decision making there so um, yeah, and, and, and with, with, with the example of, of, the, of, of exotic uh, source systems then you have to do uh, a system conversion basically right so that's that's impossible to have a zero downtime so that's always a couple of minutes hours at least yeah but still we call it near zero downtime right because it's the closest to zero uh, yeah good marketing whoever invented it i Agree with that. Yes, very last very question. Clever marketing. <laughs> very last. Oh, no, very last. Sorry, but you I think it's. I think it's really important, Joe, because people talk about these patterns and near zero, near zero, and and whatever else. But we've we've had a customer that we were unsuccessful with. Uh, they chose another vendor, um, and yes, yeah. they they got close to production and then realised their downtime window was going to be thirty eight hours. And the, the reason why is that it didn't have the approach or the technology to be able to do it. We would have done it in six and we had use cases that shows we could do it in six. Now the cost of that major manufacturer of the difference between 38 and six is a large number. So certainly with the benefit of hindsight, they would have uh, probably made a different decision, but, it, but it's really important that you actually understand these concepts when going through a process quite often what we're recommending is based on our our long years of experience and, and not just trying to sell a gimmick i guess yeah very yeah, fair point agreed. actually that cost of downtime can be astronomical so um yeah very fair points i think those two questions have run us out of time unfortunately uh jason i hand back to you yeah look i think in in summary there's been some good points made from from the team but from my perspective, I, I guess I opened it up at the start. Uh, Lemongrass is a specialist for SAP on cloud. Um, NZDT or any approach, whether it's migrate or operate um, from a managed service perspective is pretty important and changing really fast. So do leverage a specialist like Lemongrass. Mike, thoughts? Yeah, so automation is key. Right? I think we addressed this several times. Without proper automation, there, there, there's no NZDT solution. Uh, and that, that's for migrations and for in the operate space, more even in the operate space, because ongoing maintenance, patching, monthly cycles, it's so important to have that automation in place. Good point. Mr. Walker? Yeah, look, from my perspective, planning is everything. Trial it out, uh, refine it, replan it as required do get the right team in place, uh, experience does count. Um, analyze the order of your activities to minimize the impact on, on the business. Invest in the time up front to, to workshop the various scenarios. Rehearse the one, run sheets. You know, having a walk through the run sheet is actually a really important part of, of your pre-cutover activities in order to understand them and refine them. Um, and stress the importance of sticking to that plan. Mr. Cullen. 
Yes. Uh, so probably from an operate perspective, I, I would I would urge you to to think about the long term. Uh, everybody thinks and focuses on the migrate, but think in the long term in your operate. Um, you know, understand new trends and and how the power of automation that we spoke about uh, can help you. Uh, fail forward patterns, and uh, you know they're amazing at the moment in, in reducing risk and speeding up operations. Uh, ransomware patterns using fail forward. Uh, one example of proven techniques being used in the new new ways. Um, I mentioned before leverage a digital service catalog. So items like new systems, stopping, starting, uh, scaling. They're, they're all using proven automation, which is good. Uh, that kind of eliminates the need for human steps and probably ultimately put the cloud in SAP, you know, with that mantra of you know, get rid of some old thinking out there uh, and don't just create a data center in the sky. I'll leave you that one. Good point. I like that one. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> a, good one. a profound yeah. ending there, Barry, a profound ending Indeed. to, to <laughs> leave it on. So. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you to everyone who joined us today, also to our panellists. Um, as Jason mentioned, this session has been recorded, so I'll be sharing the link to the recording in the next few days. If you've got any questions at all, I'll also share the contact details for the, for the panellists if you'd like to ask some further questions. So with that, thanks ever so much for joining and I wish you a good rest of the day. Thanks ever so much. Thank Bye. you all. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, everybody.